Women in Islam versus versus women in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the myth and the reality part 1. Introduction Five years ago, I read in the Toronto Star issue of July 3, 1990 an article titled Islam is not alone in patriarchal doctrines, by Gwyn Dyer. The article described the furious reactions of the participants of a conference on women and power held in Montreal to the comments of the famous Egyptian feminist Dr. Nawal Sadawi. Her politically incorrect statements included The most restrictive elements towards women can be found first in Judaism in the Old Testament, then in Christianity, and then in the Quran. All religions are patriarchal because they stem from patriarchal societies and Veiling of women is not a specifically Islamic practice but an ancient cultural heritage with analogies in sister religions. The participants could not bear sitting around while their faiths were being equated with Islam. Thus, Dr. Sadawi received a barrage of criticism. Dr. Sadawi's comments are unacceptable. Her answers reveal a lack of understanding about other people's faiths, declared Bernice Du Bois of the World Movement of Mothers. I must protest, said panelist Alice Shalvey of Israel Women's Network. There is no conception of the veil in Judaism. The article attributed these furious protests to the strong tendency in the West to scapegoat Islam for practices that are just as much a part of the West's own cultural heritage. Christian and Jewish feminists were not going to sit around being discussed in the same category as those wicked Muslims, wrote Gwyn Dyer. I was not surprised that the conference participants had held such a negative view of Islam, especially when women's issues were involved. In the West, Islam is believed to be the symbol of the subordination of women par excellence. In order to understand how firm this belief is, it is enough to mention that the Minister of Education in France, the land of Voltaire, has recently ordered the expulsion of all young Muslim women wearing the veil from French schools, the Globe and Mail, October 4, 1994. A young Muslim student wearing a headscarf is denied her right of education in France, while a Catholic student wearing a cross or a Jewish student wearing a skullcap is not. The scene of French policemen preventing young Muslim women wearing headscarves from entering their high school is unforgettable. It inspires the memories of another equally disgraceful scene of Governor George Wallace of Alabama in 1962 standing in front of a schoolgate trying to block the entrance of black students in order to prevent the desegregation of Alabama's schools. The difference between the two scenes is that the black students had the sympathy of so many people in the U.S. and in the whole world. President Kennedy sent the U.S. National Guard to force the entry of the black students. The Muslim girls, on the other hand, received no help from anyone. Their cause seems to have very little sympathy either inside or outside France. The reason is the widespread misunderstanding and fear of anything Islamic in the world today. What intrigued me the most about the Montreal conference was one question, were the statements made by Sadawi, or any of her critics, factual? In other words, do Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have the same conception of women? Are they different in their conceptions? Do Judaism and Christianity, truly, offer women a better treatment than Islam does? What is the truth? It is not easy to search for and find answers to these difficult questions. The first difficulty is that one has to be fair and objective or, at least, do one's utmost to be so. This is what Islam teaches. The Quran has instructed Muslims to say the truth even if those who are very close to them do not like it. Whenever you speak, speak justly, even if a near relative is concerned, he has, likewise, prohibited you from saying that which is false when relating an incident or giving testimony. Displaying unfair preference to a relative or friend, Quran 6 152. O oh, you who have faith in Allah and follow his messenger, uphold justice in all conditions. Testifying to the truth with respect to every person, even if that means you have to admit a right due on you, your parents or your relatives. A person's being poor or rich should not make you give or avoid giving testimony, because Allah is closer to the poor or rich person than you are, and he knows what is in their best interests. Do not be led by your desires in your testimony, so that you do not deviate from the truth in it. If you distort the testimony by giving it inaccurately or if you turn away from fulfilling it, then Allah knows what you do. Quran 4 135 The other great difficulty is the overwhelming breadth of the subject. Therefore, during the last few years, I have spent many hours reading the Bible, the Encyclopedia of Religion, and the Encyclopedia Judaica searching for answers. I have also read several books discussing the position of women in different religions written by scholars, apologists, and critics. 
The material presented in the following chapters represents the important findings of this humble research. I don't claim to be absolutely objective. This is beyond my limited capacity. All I can say is that I have been trying, throughout this research, to approach the Quranic ideal of speaking justly. I would like to emphasize in this introduction that my purpose for this study is not to denigrate Judaism or Christianity. As Muslims, we believe in the divine origins of both. No one can be a Muslim without believing in Moses and Jesus as great prophets of God. My goal is only to vindicate Islam and pay a tribute, long overdue in the West, to the final truthful message from God to the human race. I would also like to emphasize that I concerned myself only with doctrine. That is, my concern is, namely, the position of women in the three religions as it appears in their original sources not as practiced by their millions of followers in the world today. Therefore, most of the evidence cited comes from the Quran, the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, the Bible, the Talmud, and the sayings of some of the most influential church fathers whose views have contributed immeasurably to defining and shaping Christianity. This interest in the sources relates to the fact that understanding a certain religion from the attitudes and the behavior of some of its nominal followers is misleading. Many people confuse culture with religion, many others do not know what their religious books are saying, and many others do not even care. Part 1 Eve's Fault The three religions agree on one basic fact, both women and men are created by God, the creator of the whole universe. However, disagreement starts soon after the creation of the first man, Adam, and the first woman, Eve. The Judeo-Christian conception of the creation of Adam and Eve is narrated in detail in Genesis 2 4 3 24. God prohibited both of them from eating the fruits of the forbidden tree. The serpent seduced Eve to eat from it and Eve, in turn, seduced Adam to eat with her. When God rebuked Adam for what he did, he put all the blame on Eve, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Consequently, God said to Eve, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing, with pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. The Islamic conception of the first creation is found in several places in the Quran, for example. Then Allah told Adam, O Adam go and dwell you and your wife Eve in the paradise, and eat from the good things in it, but do not approach and eat from that tree. For if you both eat from that tree after my prohibiting it you would be of those who transgress my limits. Satan told them, Allah has only forbidden you from eating from that tree because he does not want you to become angels or to live eternally in paradise. Satan swore to the two of them saying, By Allah, I am to you both, O Adam and Eve, a sincere advisor in what I direct you to. So Satan brought them down from their high position through trickery and deception. When they ate from the tree which they had been forbidden to eat from, their private parts became exposed and visible to them. So they started to fix leaves from paradise onto themselves in order to cover up. Their Lord called to them, Did I not forbid you both from eating from this tree, and did I not warn you that Satan is your clear enemy? Adam and Eve said, O our Lord, we have wronged ourselves by doing what you forbade us from, and surely if you do not forgive us and have mercy on us we will be amongst the losers, losing our share of the worldly life and hereafter. Quran 7 hours 19 minutes and 23 seconds. A careful look into the two accounts of the story of the creation reveals some essential differences. The Quran, contrary to the Bible, places equal blame on both Adam and Eve for their mistake. Nowhere in the Quran can one find even the slightest hint that Eve tempted Adam to eat from the tree or even that she had eaten before him. Even the Quran is no temptress, no seducer, and no deceiver. Moreover, Eve is not to be blamed for the pains of childbearing. God, according to the Quran, punishes no one for another's faults. Both Adam and Eve committed a sin and then asked God for forgiveness and he forgave them both. Part 2 Eve's Legacy The image of Eve as temptress in the Bible has resulted in an extremely negative impact on women throughout the Judeo-Christian tradition. All women were believed to have inherited from their mother, the biblical Eve, both her guilt and her guile. Consequently, they were all untrustworthy, morally inferior, and wicked. Menstruation, pregnancy, and childbearing were considered the just punishment for the eternal guilt of the cursed female sex. 
In order to appreciate how negative the impact of the biblical Eve was on all her female descendants we have to look at the writings of some of the most important Jews and Christians of all time. Let us start with the Old Testament and look at excerpts from what is called the wisdom literature in which we find. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare, while I was still searching but not finding. I found one upright man among a thousand but not one upright woman among them all sad face Ecclesiastes 7 verses 26 to 28. In another part of the Hebrew literature which is found in the Catholic Bible we read. No wickedness comes anywhere near the wickedness of a woman, sin began with a woman and thanks to her we all must die, Ecclesiasticus 25 colon 19, 24. Jewish rabbis listed nine curses inflicted on women as a result of the fall, to the woman he gave nine curses and death, the burden of the blood of menstruation and the blood of virginity. The burden of pregnancy, the burden of childbirth, the burden of bringing up the children, her head is covered as one in mourning. She pierces her ear like a permanent slave or slave girl who serves her master, she is not to be believed as a witness. And after everything death. Leonard J. Dutt Swidler, Women in Judaism, The Status of Women Informative Judaism, Matuchin, N.J. Scarecrow Press, 1976, page 115. To the present day, Orthodox Jewish men in their daily morning prayer recite, Blessed be God King of the Universe that thou hast not made me a woman. The women, on the other hand, thank God every morning for making me according to thy will, Thena Kendiff, Memories of an Orthodox Youth in Susanna Heschel, ed. On Being a Jewish Feminist, New York, Schocken Books, 1983, pages 96-97. Another prayer found in many Jewish prayer books, Praised be God that he has not created me a Gentile. Praised be God that he has not created me a woman. Praised be God that he has not created me an ignoramus, swiddler, op. Set, pp 80-81. The biblical Eve has played a far bigger role in Christianity than in Judaism. Her sin has been pivotal to the whole Christian faith because the Christian conception of the reason for the mission of Jesus Christ on earth stems from Eve's disobedience to God. She had sinned and then seduced Adam to follow her suit. Consequently, God expelled both of them from heaven to earth, which had been cursed because of them. They decreased their sin, which had not been forgiven by God, to all their descendants and, thus, all humans are born in sin. In order to purify human beings from their original sin, God had to sacrifice Jesus, who is considered to be the Son of God, on the cross. Therefore, Eve is responsible for her own mistake, her husband's sin, the original sin of all humanity, and the death of the Son of God. In other words, one woman acting on her own caused the fall of humanity, Rosemary R. Ruther, Christianity, in Arvind Sharma, edition, Women in World Religions, Albany. State University of New York Press, 1987, page 209. What about her daughters? They are sinners like her and have to be treated as such. Listen to the severe tone of St. Paul, Indiana, the New Testament. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I don't permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. 1 Timothy 2 verses 11-14. St. Tertullian was even more blunt than St. Paul, while he was talking to his best beloved sisters in the faith, he said. For all the sayings of the prominent saints, see Karen Armstrong, The Gospel According to Woman, London. Elm Tree Books, 1986, pp 52-62.c Also Nancy Van Buren, The Subversion of Women is Practiced by Churches, Witch Hunters, and Other Sexists, Philadelphia, Westminster Press, pp 28-30. Do you not know that you are each an Eve? The sentence of God on this sex of yours lives in this age, the guilt must of necessity live too. You are the devil's gateway, you are the unsealer of the forbidden tree, you are the first deserter of the divine law, you are she who persuaded him whom the devil was not valiant enough to attack. You destroyed so easily God's image, man. On account of your desert even the Son of God had to die. St. Augustine was faithful to the legacy of his predecessors, he wrote to a friend. What is the difference whether it is in a wife or a mother, it is still Eve the temptress that we must beware of in any woman, I fail to see what use woman can be to man. If one excludes the function of bearing children. Centuries later, St. Thomas Aquinas still considered women as defective. 
As regards the individual nature, woman is defective and misbegotten, for the active force in the male seed tends to the production of a perfect likeness in the masculine sex. While the production of woman comes from a defect in the active force or from some material indisposition, or even from some external influence. Finally, the renowned reformer Martin Luther could not see any benefit from a woman but bringing into the world as many children as possible regardless of any side effects. If they become tired or even die, that does not matter. Let them die in childbirth, that's why they are there. Again and again all women are denigrated because of the image of Eve the temptress, thanks to the Genesis account. To sum up, the Judeo-Christian conception of women has been poisoned by the belief in the sinful nature of Eve and her female offspring. If we now turn our attention to what the Quran has to say about women, we will soon realize that the Islamic conception of women is radically different from the Judeo-Christian one. Let the Quran speak for itself. He has prohibited you from becoming involved with the wealth of orphans, those who lose their father before maturity, until they became mature and are considered to be sensible. Unless you do so in a manner that brings benefit and an increase in that wealth. He has also prohibited you from giving short measure or weight, rather, it is necessary that you are fair and just when taking or giving anything in a purchase and sale transaction. He does not burden a soul more than it can bear, and you will not be taken to task for any increase or decrease in measure that is unintentional. He has, likewise, prohibited you from saying that which is false when relating an incident or giving testimony, displaying unfair preference to a relative or friend. He has, too, prohibited you from breaking Allah's pledge. If you make a pledge with Allah or in Allah's name, then such pacts must be fulfilled. Allah has instructed you with the above in the hope that you would ponder over the outcomes see actions. Quran 33, 35 The believers, men and women, are helpers to one another, because of the faith that unites them. They command good, which is everything loved by Allah, represented by the various forms of obedience, such as accepting His oneness and the ritual prayer, and they prohibit evil, which is everything hated by Allah, and include sins such as disbelief and dealing in usury in financial transactions. They perform the ritual prayer in a complete manner, and they obey Allah and His Messenger. People with these praiseworthy qualities will receive Allah's mercy. Allah is mighty and nothing can overcome Him. He is wise in His creating, handling of matters and establishment of laws. Quran 9 hours 71 minutes So their Lord responded to their prayer, saying that He does not allow the reward of anything you do, small or big, to be lost, whether the person who does it is male or female. You are from one another in your origins, and the faith that you follow does not reward males and females differently. Those who emigrated for the sake of Allah, driven from their homes by the disbelievers, suffered harm in order to obey their Lord. And who fought for the sake of Allah and died so that the word of Allah would be supreme, they will certainly be forgiven their sins on the day of judgment. It will be overlooked, and they will be entered into gardens with rivers flowing under their palaces, as a reward from Allah with Allah is the best reward, unlike any other. Quran 3 195 Whoever does a bad action, he will never be rewarded except with the like of what he did, without punishment being added to it. And whoever does a good action seeking Allah's pleasure through it, whether the doer is male or female, provided he is a believer in Allah and his messengers, will enter paradise on the day of judgment. Allah will grant them provision, through what he has placed in it of fruits and the everlasting pleasure which will never end, without account. Quran 40 40 Whoever does good deeds in accordance with the sacred law, whether male or female, while having faith in Allah, we will grant them in this world a good life. By their being pleased with Allah's decree, content and guided towards righteous actions. And we will reward them in the afterlife in accordance with the best good deeds that they used to do in the world. Quran 16 hours 97 minutes It is clear that the Quranic view of women is no different than that of men. They, both, are God's creatures whose sublime goal on earth is to worship their Lord, do righteous deeds, and avoid evil and they, both, will be assessed accordingly. The Quran never mentions that the woman is the devil's gateway or that she is a deceiver by nature. The Quran, also, never mentions that man is God's image, all men and all women are his creatures, that is all.
According to the Quran, a woman's role on earth is not limited only to childbirth. She is required to do as many good deeds as any other man is required to do. The Quran never says that no upright women have ever existed. To the contrary, the Quran has instructed all the believers, women as well as men, to follow the example of those ideal women such as the Virgin Mary and the Pharaoh's wife. And Allah also mentions an example to those who have faith in him and his messengers. That their connections with the disbelievers will not harm them or affect them as long as they remain steadfast upon the truth, the example of the wife of Pharaoh when she said, O my Lord, build a house for me near you in paradise, and save me from the tyranny of Pharaoh, his might and his evil deeds. And save me also from the people who wrong themselves by following him in his transgression and oppression. And Allah also mentions an example for those who have faith in him and his messengers, in the condition of Mary the daughter of Imran who safeguarded her private parts from fornication. So Allah commanded Gabriel to blow into her due to which she fell pregnant through the power of Allah with Jesus the son of Mary, without a father. She also believed in the religions of Allah and the books revealed to his messengers, and she was obedient to Allah by fulfilling his commands and refraining from the things he did not allow. Quran 66:11-12 Women in Islam Part 3 Shameful Daughters In fact, the difference between the biblical and the Quranic attitude towards the female sex starts as soon as a female is born. For example, the Bible states that the period of the mother's ritual impurity is twice as long if a girl is born than if a boy is, Lev. 12.2-5, the Catholic Bible states explicitly that, the birth of a daughter is a loss, Ecclesiasticus 22.3. In contrast to this shocking statement, boys receive special praise, a man who educates his son will be the envy of his enemy. Ecclesiasticus 30.3. Jewish rabbis made it an obligation on Jewish men to produce offspring in order to propagate the race. At the same time, they did not hide their clear preference for male children. It is well for those whose children are male but ill for those whose are female, at the birth of a boy, all are joyful, at the birth of a girl all are sorrowful. And when a boy comes into the world, peace comes into the world. When a girl comes, nothing comes. Swidler, Opsit, page 140. A daughter is considered a painful burden, a potential source of shame to her father, your daughter is headstrong? Keep a sharp lookout that she does not make you the laughingstock of your enemies, the talk of the town, the object of common gossip, and put you to public shame, Ecclesiasticus 42. 11. Keep a headstrong daughter under firm control, or she will abuse any indulgence she receives. Keep a strict watch on her shameless eye, do not be surprised if she disgraces you, Ecclesiasticus 26.10-11. It was this very same idea of treating daughters as sources of shame that led the pagan Arabs, before the advent of Islam, to practice female infanticide. The Quran severely condemned this heinous practice, when news is brought to one of them of the birth of a female child, his face darkens and he is filled with inward grief. With shame does he hide himself from his people because of the bad news he has had. Shall he retain her on contempt or bury her in the dust? Ah! What an evil they decide on! Quran 16:59. It has to be mentioned that this sinister crime would have never stopped in Arabia were it not for the power of the scathing terms the Quran used to condemn this practice, Quran 1659, 43 17, 81. 8-9. He hides from his people because of the bad news of the birth of a girl that was given to him. He asks himself, shall he keep this girl that he was given news of with humiliation and dejection, or shall he bury her alive and hide her in the dust? How evil is the decision that the idolaters make when they assign to their Lord what they detest for themselves? And Nalf 59 When one of them is given news of the birth of a female whom he attributes to his Lord, his face becomes gloomy out of severe grief and sadness, and he himself becomes full of anger. How then can he attribute to his Lord the very thing that he himself is saddened by when informed of it? Az Zukraf 17 When the girl buried alive is asked by Allah. For what crime were you killed by the person who killed you? Attack were 8-9. The Quran, moreover, makes no distinction between boys and girls. In contrast to the Bible, the Quran considers the birth of a female as a gift and a blessing from God, the same as the birth of a male. The Quran even mentions the gift of the female birth first, to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. He creates what he wills.
He bestows female children to whomever he wills and bestows male children to whomever he wills. Or he makes for whoever he wills both males and females and makes whoever he wills barren and childless. He knows what occurs and what will occur in the future. This is on account of the completeness of his knowledge and perfection of his wisdom. Nothing is hidden from him. He is able to do all things, nothing is outside his ability. Quran 42 49 In order to wipe out all the traces of female infanticide in the nascent Muslim society. Prophet Muhammad promised those who were blessed with daughters of a great reward if they would bring them up kindly. He who is involved in bringing up daughters and accords benevolent treatment towards them, they will be protection for him against hellfire, Bukhari and Muslim. Whoever maintains two girls till they attain maturity, he and I will come on the resurrection day like this, and he joined his fingers, Muslim. 